Warcraft 3 Reign of Chaos is a Corruption. Thou art my father. Simulator developed by Blizzard Entertainment and released in July 2002 for Windows and Mac. The game is a full 3D rendition of the classical RTS format brought about by its predecessors, and includes all the new bells and whistles you would expect to come along in a sequel such as this. It also bears the continuation slash expansion of the stories that were told through the previous two games. One year later, in July 2003, the expansion, The Frozen Throne, was released, which included even more content for both gameplay and story. For this review, I'll be referring to and using footage of the original game, as it's the version I'm most familiar with and preferential to. Call it nostalgia if you wish, because it probably is, but I just love the charm and whimsy of these bright, blocky graphics. And when I think Warcraft 3, this is the way it appears in my head. Towards the end of the video, I'll have a few comments regarding the Reforged remake, but both versions are nearly identical in content, and for the most part, aside from minor gameplay tweaks, the only differences are presentation of visuals and audio alone. So anything I have to say should be applicable to both versions. Prior to Warcraft 3's release, Blizzard had begun to eke their way into mainstream recognition, particularly following the release of the absurdly successful StarCraft and its expansions. Those who had been following the company at the time were eager to see what the folks at Blizzard would come up with next for their Warcraft universe, but at the time, Warcraft 3 wasn't actually the next intended release. A point-and-click adventure game entitled Lord of the Clans was initially meant to be released sometime before Warcraft 3 in order to introduce certain characters and story elements. However, due to several complications between game design and interstudio relations, the game wound up being cancelled and its story instead handed off to writer Christy Golden to be turned into a novel that was then published in 2001. Actually, in total, throughout 2001, three novels were released which took place within the Warcraft universe and were designed to flesh out the world of Warcraft, if you'll forgive the pun. All three were written by different authors, and of which only the latter two, Day of the Dragon and Lord of the Clans, actually made it to print. Sorry, Chris. Elements from these novels are at best lightly alluded to within Warcraft 3 itself, and act only as supplemental resources for those interested. Chiefly, they're notable for being the origins of many of the major characters within the wider Warcraft narrative, such as Thrall, Sylvanas, Falstad, and eventually playing part in the contradiction that sparked the Great Red Shirt Massacre of 2010. Game at all. What happened to him? Isn't Falstad dead? From, uh, Day of the Dragon? No? Of course, none of the novels are required reading to get up to date with the Warcraft narrative, as included within the manual of the game is an extensive backstory and presentation of all the primary characters, themes, locations, etc., which are then subsequently explored within the game itself. Everything you need to know is all in here, and for a game that contains a greater narrative focus, naturally there's more than ever before. In fact, there's more backstory in this game alone than the other two combined, and it's not surprising to learn that Blizzard had been in the process of creating their Warcraft MMO pretty much side by side with this game, as the announcements for both were spaced a mere one year apart. But it's worth mentioning that even with that said, just about everything mentioned in the backstory can be seen in some form or another within the actual game, so there's no superfluous flavor text strewn about just so you have something to read in the bathroom. That's what the novels are for. Now more than ever, the backstory can strengthen your understanding of the events and plot within the game as it's in motion, and enhance the overall narrative as a whole. It's still cheesy high fantasy power ballad mumbo jumbo, but it does have genuine substance and lore that can be pretty fun to dig into. Usually. It has its pitfalls, of course, but overall it's still pretty decent and is a massive improvement over the previous games as the stories take on a more character-driven approach, making events feel more relatable rather than a scroll of text to accompany your mission directive. Rather than have you take my word for it, I'll once again illustrate with a badly drawn slideshow. I'll do my best to put the events in chronological order, but I'll mention again that there's quite a lot of it. Five distinct narratives, actually. And if you don't care about any of it, or you just want to jump ahead to the gameplay, then go ahead and skip to this timecode, or check the index in the description. And of course, if you want, you can just read the manual yourself to get the whole story. I put a lot of work into this, though, so it would mean a lot to me if you just sat back and watched. Still here? Oh, thank you. Unlike the last two times, the histories given are not told by in-universe characters, so we can assume that all the information given is factual. However, the Warcraft story has been worked on a lot since this game was released, and this summary only regards the actual info given within the manual, so it's possible that certain details were changed or rewritten by Blizzard at a later date. And as such, some of this info may not be entirely up to date or accurate with the current mythos. Since I'm not using any reference outside the games themselves, certain visual elements are going to be my own, uh, let's call it artistic interpretation. So, step aside, Peter Lee. I got this one. Just one more preface. This game takes the general structure of the previous two games and rewrites a lot of the details to fit a new and more internally consistent chronicle. If you want to compare what's changed, just watch the other two videos by following their corresponding links listed below. I'll give you a few seconds to pause the video and do that now if you wish. All set? Cool. Let's get it on. It all started at the beginning of the universe. Yeah. Seriously. 
The origin of the universe is unknown. Some believe the universe began as an enormous, tremendous explosion. Sort of a large kapow, if you will. It flung matter and energy outwards into the vast, dark nothingness, eventually coalescing into planets and stars and generating various diverse life forms. The other theory is that the universe was created through the deliberate construction of a single deific entity. In essence, a sort of rational arrangement, if you will. Regardless of which happens to be true, once the universe began, several metallic godlike beings sprung up along with it whose sole intention was to create order from their chaotic universe, creating habitable planets and life and whatnot. They were also vanguards against demons who lived in the Twisting Nether, a plane of existence to which all other universes are connected. These demons were the complete opposite of our friendly metallic titans. Their only desire was to destroy life and, quote, devour the energies of the living universe. Sargeris, who is now pronounced Sargeris for whatever reason, being the most powerful of all the titans, was tasked to lead the resistance against the demons. Sargeris fought for countless eons and became all pouty face after encountering a particularly nasty race of sorcerers called the Eridar, who had the power to corrupt the peaceful races and turn them into demons. He became even more pouty face after encountering some soul-stealing and conniving vampires named the Nathrezim, who were more commonly referred to as Dreadlords. Eventually, Sargeras became so sad and depressed by the sheer evil he faced, he considered his crusade hopeless. And as he continued to brood through the years, he reasoned that chaos was indeed the natural state of the universe, and that order was the true enemy. So, Sargeras freed the Eridar and the Nathrezim as a means to create an unstoppable demon army. He appointed two Eridar to act as lieutenants, the demon Kil'jaeden, whom we're already familiar with, and Archimond, whom we'll encounter once we actually get into the game. With countless demons under his command, Sargeras dubs them the Burning Legion and unleashes them out into the universe to extinguish all life. Meanwhile, the rest of the Titans, completely oblivious to Sargeras' crisis, encountered a planet ruled by a bunch of elemental spirits who worshipped evil beings known as the Old Gods. After burying the five Old Gods and dispelling the elementals, the Titans nurtured the planet that would become Azeroth and created one giant continent called Kalimdor with a large lake in the center known as the Well of Eternity, whose energies helped nourish all life on the continent and at the time was the source of all magic in the world. Finally, the Titans, apparently quite proud of their creation, imbued some of their own powers into five great dragons to act as guardians for the planet. And with that, the Titans were satisfied and left Azeroth to create more worlds. The end. Of part one. We've still got way more world building to go through, starting with the creation of a race which makes its debut in this game, the Night Elves. The Kaldore, or Night Elves, were among the first sentient life on Kalimdor, and being attracted to the powers of the Well of Eternity, set up shop along its shores. The Night Elves had all of Kalimdor as their oyster, and even befriended a demigod of nature named Cenarius, who taught them all about the natural world. The Night Elves also had a queen named Azshara, whom most of the Elves loved, and an upper class called the Highborn, whom most of the Elves despised. The Highborn studied the Well of Eternity and divined the first magics from it. However, as they studied and practiced magic, the more it came to corrupt and ensnare them, including the queen. The High Elves were abusing magic so carelessly that even Sargeras was able to notice it from the Twisting Nether. And once he detected this juicy new source of life and the well spewing a seemingly limitless supply of magical energy, he gathered the rest of the Burning Legion and sprang into action to consume it. Ashara and the Highborn were so drunk off of magic and terrified of the demons' power that they willingly allowed the demons' entrance to the world, where they were able to ravage the lands practically unopposed. One of the Night Elf scholars, Furion Stormrage, or Malfurion if you prefer, teamed up with his girlfriend Tyronda and his brother Illidan, who was recently converted away from practicing highborn magic and also had the hots for Tyronda. Together they set out to get help from Cenarius, the nature god. Cenarius was able to contact Alastraza, queen of the five dragons, and send their broods to combat the demons. However, even with the combined efforts of all the dragons, along with the aid of Cenarius' Ents and the Night Elf armies, they were no match for the Burning Legion's forces, whose numbers continued to increase with every passing day. Ashara concocted a plan to use the Well of Eternity to bring Sargeras himself into Azeroth and decidedly secure their victory. Meanwhile, Furion was able to notice that the Well was being used as a portal from which the demons were coming, and reasoned that the only way to stop the flood of demons would be to destroy the Well. This would also end all the magical energy in the world, and Illidan, having been one of the Highborn, couldn't reconcile this, and so he betrayed his brother and decided to aid the Queen in order to protect the Well. Ashara and the Highborn were in the midst of their incantation to summon Sargeras when Furion's forces attacked. However, thanks to Illidan's warning, they were able to counter the attack and thwart them. Despite this, in the confusion of the moment, the incantation was sent askew and ended up ripping the well apart and blew out a hole so huge that the entire continent was rent into three separate continents. A rush of ocean water cascaded in to fill in the hole from the explosion, and an enormous everlasting whirlpool formed where the well used to be. However, before the well's destruction, Illidan stole away a few vials of its water as a contingency. He made his way to Mount Hyjal, the home of Cenarius, and poured his vials into the lake at its center, creating an all-new Well of Eternity. Furion, Tyronda, and the remainder of the elves also made their way to Mount Hyjal to make their new home only to discover Illidan had already arrived. 
Furion now saw magic as a poison, and was so outraged with Illidan's actions that he had Illidan chained and locked away inside a great prison for him to spend the rest of his days. The elves could do nothing about the new well, but swore an oath never to practice magic again, and so they followed the teaching of Cenarius instead to become druids, and nurture the world back to health. Eventually, the great dragons met up with Furion and learned of the new well, so together they worked to stop its power from being abused. Alexstrasza the Red planted an acorn to suck up the energies of the new well, which grew into an enormous tree that canopied the entire mountain. Nosdormu the Bronze placed an enchantment which prevented the elves from aging or becoming ill so long as the tree stood. And finally, Isera the Green linked the tree to her ethereal realm known as the Emerald Dream, which helped shape the evolutionary path of nature, and the elves had to spend centuries of time sleeping in order to inhabit the dream, conduct the flow of life, and become one with nature or whatever. The remaining highborn were undergoing strong withdrawal pangs, and eventually became so restless that they attempted an uprising helmed by a guy named Dathramar against the Night Elves, which ultimately failed. Due to the Night Elves' benevolence, rather than killing off the highborn, they stuck them on boats and sent them off to a new continent of their own, and where they landed would eventually become known as Lordaeron. Here, the Highborn renamed themselves High Elves, set up shop in their own new city, and I guess because of their previous knowledge of the arts, were able to practice their own magic with impunity, despite being incredibly far away from the new well. Back on the Night Elf side, all the druids, including Furion, settled down to begin their great sleep. Tyrande was in charge of holding the vigil while the druids slept, so she gathered a small army of warriors to patrol and protect the lands while her boyfriend had a snooze. The end. Next up, we've got the Undead, which also contains a bit of orc history. So the writer at this point can't decide whether they want the orcs to be good guys or bad guys, and in the same paragraph describes the orcs as a noble, tranquil, and shamanistic society, but also as brutal, savage warriors capable of relentless bloodshed. I'm not entirely sure how those things correlate, though I guess you could say the same thing about earlier real-life human tribes. For our purposes, we'll just say that they were principled, but also had some aggressive proclivities. So anyway, the demon kill Jaden saw the orcs under Nor and saw their destructive potential, and decided that he wanted to use them as a division of the Burning Legion. Kil'jaeden approached the orcs' most respected shaman leader, Ner'zhul, and tempted him with limitless magical wisdom, and in return, Ner'zhul would direct the orcs to the will of the Legion. Ner'zhul, blinded by his greed, agreed to the bargain, but quickly realized that such a deal would doom the orcs to a life of slavery under the Legion, and he decided that maybe that wasn't such a good idea. So Ner'zhul opted out of the deal, which greatly upset Kil'jaeden, who decided to look for the next best candidate in order to fulfill his will. That candidate just so happened to be Ner'zhul's apprentice, Gul'dan. Gul'dan was altogether more ambitious and power-hungry than Ner'zhul, so he accepted the deal and swiftly abolished shamanism, spread the practice of demon worship, and set to congregating the orcish masses into a single tremendous army that would be known as the Horde. Eventually, the orcs invade Azeroth and the events of the first game take place with the orcs securing victory against the humans in the first war. This is then, unsurprisingly, followed by the second war where the Alliance comes together and is able to obliterate the Horde and destroy the portal between the worlds. Ner'zhul, regretting his role in all this and fearing Kil'jaeden's retribution, gathers the remaining orcs and sets about his plans to escape Draenor, which we saw in the Beyond the Dark Portal expansion. In the fullness of time, he indeed manages to open up a portal to the Twisting Nether in order to escape, but because of this, Draenor begins tearing itself apart. Ner'zhul and the remaining orcs hop into the portal thinking they've escaped their doom, but in fact all they accomplished was delivering themselves straight to Kil'jaeden's doorstep. Kil'jaeden seizes Ner'zhul's spirit and literally tears his physical body to shreds. Ner'zhul pleads for death, but because of their earlier agreement, Kil'jaeden retains ownership over Ner'zhul's soul to be used for his own designs. Kil'jaeden desired a newer and better army than what the orcs provided, so he offered Ner'zhul a new deal to submit to the Legion absolutely and helm his new great army. Ner'zhul's only other option was eternal suffering, so he reluctantly agreed. With Kil'jaeden's power, the remaining Death Knights and Warlocks that Ner'zhul brought with him were immediately killed, um, again, and raised back from the dead, again, to become liches. Ner'zhul's spirit was placed inside a massive block of ice and given demonic power to expand his consciousness and control his undead followers. Ner'zhul then became known as the Lich King and his followers the Scourge, and they were tasked with killing off the human armies of Azeroth to turn them into undead followers as well. According to the bargain, Kil'jaeden promised Ner'zhul to return him to a new and healthy body if he was able to accomplish the tasks given to him. But Kil'jaeden still felt skeptical of Ner'zhul's loyalty and assigned the Nathrezim, aka the Dreadlords, to act as a sort of police to the Scourge and ensure their plans would unfold as intended. Kil'jaeden flung Ner'zhul's icy prison into Azeroth, where it landed in the northern continent of Northrend. As it landed, it was warped to resemble an icy throne, and act as a sort of antenna for the Lich King to control the newly formed Scourge. His first test was to enslave the minds of nearby indigenous lifeforms, such as trolls and wendigos, and use them to spread his plague into some human settlements. After the humans were killed, they rose again as zombies, and consequently, strengthened Ner'zhul's growing power. Soon, every settlement on Northrend was consumed by his plague, except for one ancient civilization. These were the Nerubians, who were an army of giant spiders. 
They were at first immune to the Lich King's mind control, however after a long and arduous battle, the Nerubians were eventually destroyed and brought under the Scourge's control, and their architectural designs were used as a basis for the various structures of the undead. How convenient that the Nerubians share aesthetic similarities to the necrophilic Egyptians, eh? Anyway, Ner'zhul sent out a telepathic summons across Azeroth in an attempt to ally with any powerful entities able to detect it to his crusade. One powerful Archmage and member of the prestigious Kirin Tor Council of Dalaran, Kel'Thuzad, heard the Lich King's call, and having had a keen interest in the Dark Arts with no way to practice them, abandoned his position on the Council and set off to Northrend to meet with him. Ner'zhul offered Kel'Thuzad access to the Dark Power and Immortality, to which he eagerly accepted. Kel'Thuzad was tasked with converting the human masses to a religion that would worship and follow the Lich King. And so Kel'Thuzad set off back to Lordran to do just that, quite successfully as it happens, and was able to form what would be called the Cult of the Damned. Ner'zhul concentrated his energies to create a physical plague substance, which was then spread across the northern regions of Lordran to help with the Cult of the Damned, who enthusiastically sacrificed themselves to gain immortality through undeath and further spread the plague to kill unsuspecting civilians. And so the true scourge began creeping its way across Lordran. But Ner'zhul doubted Kil'jaeden's bargain and began silently scheming to search for a way to escape his frozen prison. He needed a host to possess and unshackle him from the grip of the Dreadlords and Burning Legion, and so he sent out his consciousness in search of the perfect slave. And the rest of that story, however, will be told in the game itself. And now we have to rewind the clock back a bit to just after the Second War so that we can talk about... So if you'll recall in the last game, Gul'dan deserted the Horde in order to search for the Tomb of Sargeras and attain a sort of godhood from the scepter inside, but only found terrible demons when he opened the door. In a slight retcon, it was not this handsome troll archer who heroically managed to slay Gul'dan, but actually just the demons inside the tomb instead. Anyway, this betrayal diverted Doomhammer's attention away just long enough for the Alliance to gain the upper hand against the Horde and ultimately secure victory. There's also another retcon regarding Lothar. In the last game, it was said that he attempted to parlay with the orcs and that the treacherous orcs decided to just kill him instead. But here it says that he just fell in battle. It's further explained in the human history that it was Doomhammer who killed him during an honorable one-on-one -on -one battle. I assume that this change was to stop the Horde from seeming like bad guys since we have new bad guys to direct our attention towards, and also so we don't feel an outright hatred against them since we have to step inside their shoes as good guys for this game. Obviously the wider Warcraft chronology hadn't been decided until this game, so I can forgive a small rewrite like this, although it does seem like a cop-out to take your villains from the last two games and try to portray them as good guys who were just being controlled by an evil mastermind behind a giant curtain, who was then being controlled by an eviler mastermind behind an even bigger curtain. As I said earlier, the story has pitfalls, but we'll continue on. So the Horde gets stopped, the Orcs get captured, Khadgar suddenly revealed to be Apprentice of Medivh for some reason, Portal is reopened, Ner'zhul grabs his goodies and opens a new portal on Draenor, and Draenor gets destroyed. This is not the last time we'll have to recount this. Grom Hellscream and Kilrog Deadeye, however, lead their clans through the original portal back to Azeroth just before Draenor blows up. Grom is able to evade the humans, but Kilrog and his clan get captured. There was also another rogue clan called the Dragon Maw Clan, led by a warlock named Necros, who used something called the Demon Soul to control Alexstrasza, the Dragon Queen. But they were eventually defeated, and the Demon Soul was destroyed by a guy named Ronin, and sent the Dragon Maw to an internment camps as well. If that sounded like a really weird aside to you, I'll explain why in a bit. Anyway, within said internment camps, the orcs seemed to have become less and less aggressive and more lethargic. Nobody could really figure out why until one day the Archmage Antonitis surmised that it was a result of the orcs undergoing withdrawal of the demonic power that they had been imbued with by their warlocks for so long. And so without this demonic influence coursing through their veins, the orcs became much more docile. Before we can find out what happens next with them, we again have to jump back in time a bit. During the First War, a human officer named Adalus Blackmore found a little baby orc that had been abandoned out in the wild. He took in the orc and named it Thrall, and raised him as a slave to become a fierce warrior. Adalus intended to train Thrall to become the leader of the orcs, so that Adalus could, by proxy, rule the orcs himself, and in turn use them to rule his fellow men, effectively gaining dominion over both powers. Thrall wasn't as enthusiastic about this plan, and after the second war ended, he was able to run away and set off to search for the only remaining free orc clan under Grom Hellscream. They did eventually meet, but they both had trouble rousing their fellow orcs out of the internment camps after finding that they had lost their fighting spirit. Thrall eventually left Grom to search for the Frostwolf clan, to which he apparently originally belonged. Once he found them, he learned that he was actually the son of their old chieftain, Duratan, who had been killed in the wilds around the same time that he was discovered by Adalus 20 years earlier. One of the last remaining shamans, an orc named Drek'thar, trained Thrall in the ways of shamanism, and taught him of the evils brought upon the orcs by Gul'dan and the demons. Once properly trained, Thrall was elevated to become the new chieftain of the Frostwolf clan. During their travels, they came across Orgrim Doomhammer, who had escaped captivity and had been hiding out alone for several years. Orgrim, having been a friend of Duratan, agreed to join Thrall and help set free their brethren from the humans' oppression, and thanks to Thrall's resolve, they were indeed able to revitalize some of the captured orcs' spirits. This culminated in Thrall returning to Adalus's stronghold of Durnhold, where they seized the fortress and freed the orc prisoners kept there. 
It was during this fight that Orgrim was slain in battle. Thrall took up the Doomhammer into his own hands, and after the battle had ended, the rest of the orcs praised him as the entire horde's new warchief. He and Grom fought then onward to save the orcs from ever being slaves of humans or demons ever again. The end. Okay, so the human history segment is more or less just a summary of all the other histories from the human's perspective. As such, this will be the shortest of them all, since we've heard most of it already. Funnily enough, the order in which I've gone through these histories is the reverse of the order in which they're presented in the manual. So if you read them in order, you'd first have everything teased in this segment, and then have the particulars expounded as you went further in. But I opted to keep everything mostly chronological. And we're rewinding back to the end of the Second War again, where the events at Black Rock Spire where Doomhammer kills Lothar is fully explained. Afterwards, Turalyon is able to route the orcs back to the portal, and I'm sure you all remember what happens next. Horde stopped, portal destroyed, orcs captured, portal reopened, Ner'zhul goodies, new portals opened, Draenor explodes, Khadgar and Frenz's fate unknown. From the last game, we know that they jumped into one of the portals, but there still isn't any information about where they ended up, nor will there be throughout the entirety of this game. After this, there's a recount of the Dragon Maw clan with a demon soul thing that controls Alex Strauza. Again, not really much point to the story other than that it makes the orcs even more pouty-faced than they were before. Moving on. Sometime after the war, the Alliance begins to disband, with the High Elves and some of the human kingdoms deciding they don't like King Terranus' leadership very much. However, most of the humans, wizards, and dwarves are still buddies, thanks to some of the strong ties that were formed during the war. King Terranus works with other kingdoms as leaders to protect and rebuild their territories. It's during this time that we're introduced to Terranus' son, Arthas. Prince Arthas was trained under the Dwarf King's brother, Muradin, to be a strong and capable warrior. When he was 19, he joined the ranks of the Paladins under a hero of the Second War, Uther the Lightbringer. May I remember him? They became fast friends, and Arthas proved his worth by being a reckless yet valuable asset during many disputes. He also had the hots for Admiral Proudmoore's daughter, Jaina. However, with Arthas committed to his paladin training and Jaina busy studying to chill lo-fi hip-hop beats to become a sorceress of the Kirin Tor, they both agreed not to court each other in order to pursue their respective career goals. About 13 years after the end of the Second War, rumors began to spread of a new warchief of the Horde, one whose tactical abilities managed to outwit even Uther and his paladins who sought to capture him. More troubling still is the emergence of a cult which defies the sovereignty of the king, glorifies death, and all seems to be connected to a strange plague that mysteriously appeared and has been infecting the land. The end. For real this time. At least until we get to the expansion. That was, as you can tell, a hefty, hefty amount of backstory. But like I said, almost all of it can help further your understanding of the events taking place in the game itself, which this time around is much more story-centric. We've got actual cutscenes instead of narrated text scrolls this time. Everything is fully voice acted, and each campaign flows chronologically into the next as one large narrative, kind of like Beyond the Dark Portal. There's not a whole lot to say about this backstory as it serves its purpose for setting the stage quite well, but there are a few noteworthy mentions to make. Remember that whole part with Ronin and the Demon Soul and stuff? Well, that segment is an interesting one in that it's one of the few things in the manual that has no actual bearing with the rest of the history or influence with the rest of the game. It's just kind of an, oh, by the way, this thing happened. Necros, Alexstrasza, Ronin, the Demon Soul, none of them are in the game and aren't even mentioned from this point ever again, so why is it included? Well, it's just a summary of what happened in that Day of the Dragon novel, but again, it has no relation with anything in the game, so its inclusion is still questionable. Interestingly, though, these events were somewhat mentioned during the mission briefing of Orc Mission 5 in Beyond the Dark Portal. In that mission, you're supposed to recapture some of the escaped dragons, which eventually results in you rescuing some Bleeding Hollow members, which is Kilrog's clan, and then enlisting Deathwing to your side. But all this happened before Draenor was destroyed, not after. It's a peculiar discrepancy. They could have just cut this bit out and nothing would have changed. So it's kind of funny that some of the least important information given in the manual ends up creating one of the more glaring contradictions. But anyway, let's move on. Secondly, and this one's just a nitpick, the concept of a paladin is that they fight for and get their holy powers from God, right? In this universe, we sort of know who the gods are, and it's not really clear which of them, if any, is the being from which the paladins receive their divine assistance. You'd think these demonic encounters might alert one of the titans to the legion's plots and perhaps lead to a more direct involvement, but if it's not one of the titans, is it something higher than them, or is it one of the old gods, or what? I'm sure this is explained in some capacity in some future installment of the Warcraft universe, but it's not mentioned here, and it bothered me, so I figured I'd mention it. Lastly is the radical shift in attitude regarding the orcs, with their whole lethargy from their withdrawals of demonic power. This is another attempt to sort of deflect the blame off the orcs as a whole and pin it all on the select few who are genuinely evil, and of course the demons. It's a very odd turn of character for the orcs. They've gone from being all mindless warmongering conquerors in the first game to these pitiable pawns of a much larger menace. I suppose in defense of this story, the first games were told from the perspective of individual characters, so it makes sense for them to be ignorant of the origins or hidden agendas that were apparently at hand. There's really no easy explanation you can make when you try to stop the orcs from being the bad guys all of a sudden, or why it had to be that way in the first place. I would guess it's because having a one side be evil just because of their animalistic barbarism is kind of a boring motive for your villains to have. I understand why you'd want the orcs to be more complicated and relatable, especially if you plan to have them be playable in a much more story-focused game. But then I'd argue you kind of missed the point when you tried to pin the blame on demons that are also just evil for the sake of it. 
I reckon it has something to do with the duality of power present in the MMO. Now instead of the good guys and the bad guys fighting each other, we have the good guys and the misunderstood good guys fighting the demons, or each other due to some sort of misunderstanding. This is also one of the criticisms that the lead writer, Chris Metzen, gets a lot these days. Characters can't just become evil on their own, they have to be corrupted by some mystical, otherworldly malevolence. In Metzen's eyes, it's just corrupted turtles all the way down. I could go on about how out of hand it eventually gets, but we're just focusing on Warcraft 3 at this point, and it really isn't that insulting a change to be made. I'm not as upset about demons being the new antagonists as I am disappointed at how you never really get to play as the actual bad guys anymore. Even the undead, the most obviously evil looking, and the ones that perpetrate the most evil acts are ultimately fighting against the demons in their own way too, making them anti-heroes of a sort. Sometimes you just want to play as the bad guys, and that's what the orcs represented in the previous two games, but you can't do that anymore because the narrative was corrupted. It's definitely a divisive plot device, but at the very least it justifies pretty much every race's motivations against an ever-changing and pervasive threat. It broadens the scope for what's possible in the Warcraft universe and opens the door for some compelling narratives to be told from different perspectives. Okay, well we've talked enough about story stuff for now though. There's obviously a lot more left to discuss, but how about we take a break and dig into the actual game? If you're just interested in the more narrative stuff, you can skip ahead to the storyline of the four campaigns. It's up ahead at this time code. And I'll warn you now, for those that stick around, that some of the gameplay that you see will inevitably contain story spoilers, so if you haven't played the game yet and want to experience the story for yourself, now is the time to do so. You already know all the backstory, so you're all set to start playing. Or if you just hate fun, you can skip ahead, watch my recount of it, and then come back here. Whatever you want to do. There's an index of segments in the description of this video for a reason. I've only arranged them in this particular order for the pacing of casual watchability in mind. Warcraft 3 of course follows the same general baseline as the previous entries, but the changes to structure and gameplay mechanics make it almost an entirely different beast. But most importantly, Blizzard had the good sense to omit naval combat entirely. The core backbone of collecting resources, building structures, and guiding units to do your bidding is still the bedrock on top of which all else is placed. And as one would expect from a sequel, this new entry brings with it more structures, units, enemies, locations, and perhaps most notably, more factions. Introduced to this game are the Undead and the Night Elves. Once we dig into the expansion, we'll also be introduced to the Naga and Human slash Blood Elf remix. And there are also a number of races and units which have no particular allegiance scattered about. At one point in time during development, the demons themselves were going to have their own playable faction, however they were eventually cut. Although some of the units still survive and are present in the game in one form or another as either temporary units or NPCs. The four main factions present in the base game each have their own campaign, which, as I mentioned earlier, flow from one to the other chronologically until the climactic finale under the Night Elves, where all the storylines more or less converge. Perhaps what distinguishes these campaigns above all else from those of the previous games is the implementation of a hero unit, and the distinguishing trait of the main hero unit is that they inherit light RPG elements, and as such are capable of gaining experience, leveling up, and unlocking abilities as the game progresses. The hero is also capable of dying and can be resurrected with the proper base structure. They can carry usable items between missions and benefit from other perks such as relatively quick auto-regeneration of health and mana. Campaigns can be host to more than one hero unit at a time, and some may come and go from mission to mission, much like Warcraft 2, but your main hero will usually be there from beginning to end, with perhaps one or two exceptions, and is more often than not the main character for that particular campaign. I don't think it's a stretch to say that the hero unit is the defining feature of Warcraft 3, since, in most respects, for the story mode at least, you feel as if you're playing as them, and not some invisible, omnipresent general, and is one of the most impactful departures of the series regarding gameplay that puts this game in a class of its own. You are still, of course, just a giant hand in the sky giving orders, but there's definitely an attachment built between you and the hero, as they're your most valuable and useful unit, and the act of building them up and across their campaign helps strengthen the bond. But to say the hero is the determining factor for what makes Warcraft 3 would be tragically undercutting all the other alterations made to the game. Perhaps the next most prominent feature would be the diverse distinction between races. You can learn about all the faction-specific components in the game manual, and I'll just say it now, when it comes to game manuals, Warcraft 3's has got to be one of the finest ever made. It includes all that backstory I mentioned earlier, as well as character bios, and close to everything about the gameplay distinctions for every race, unit, spell, and upgrade. Not to mention a smattering of great artwork. Whenever you hear folks lamenting the loss of game manuals in modern games, it's usually because we had stuff like this to enjoy. Anyway, even though they share a great deal of parody, the differences between the races, namely in regard to units and structures, are now much greater and allows fresh and engaging tactical approaches for each possible combination. The humans embody the classic format you know and love from the previous games, and very little has changed from how they operate aside from maybe a few new buildings and units. It should come as no surprise that this is the first campaign available after a short tutorial featuring the orcs. Speaking of whom, the orcs are again quite similar to humans, however they carry over certain quirks from previous games, such as troll health regeneration. Among other totally new changes is the ability for buildings to inherit an upgrade which damages melee units that attack them, and their towers are all archer towers by default. The Scourge is limited to placing buildings only on blighted ground which can be expanded as the buildings are erected at the borders. The blighted ground offers increased health regen to units that stand atop it, 
Buildings are summoned and thus require no active building by the peasant equivalent acolytes. Ziggurats, the equivalent to farms, can be upgraded with a projectile attack rather than building a separate structure such as an archer tower. And gold and wood harvest is split between two separate units, the acolytes and the ghouls, respectively. Finally, the night elves mostly have ancients rather than buildings, which are large ents that can uproot themselves, move locations, and even attack other units if need be. The resource gathering wisps gather wood without destroying trees and require a gold mine to be entangled by the main ent before harvesting gold. The wisps are also consumed when creating new ancients and can detonate themselves to prevent magic from being used around that area. Many units also have increased vision and the ability to become invisible while standing still during the night because, yep, there's a day-night cycle in the game too. It plays a relatively small role but provides a more concrete sense of time passing which is well utilized in missions that include a time management element. Each race has many other idiosyncrasies as well that I didn't mention, particularly in regards to their race-specific units which I won't bother to list off because, again, it's all in the manual. But for example, a Scourge Necromancer can summon skeletons from corpses, and this is then complemented by the Catapult's ability to carry corpses for later use, two traits that no other race's equivalent units share. Suffice to say, this trend continues across just about every unit, and no one unit feels quite the same from one race to any other, and the accompaniment of a particular race's heroes also changes certain efficacies in stratagem. Using the Scourge as an example again, the Death Knight hero is capable of resurrecting dead units to their original forms and attack rates, rather than just the generic skeletons that necromancers create. As you also may have noticed, each race has a unique take on the tower structure. Creating a wall of towers can be an effective defense strategy, however, the addition of more anti-tower units in concordance with the relatively slow and weak nature of towers makes them much more balanced. They can still prove to be a nuisance, as is their purpose, however, I never felt like I had to slowly pick one off from a distance as I did in Warcraft 2. This is no doubt a perk afforded by the faster and easier unit production process, as well as a higher number of units available to the player since you can now control up to 12 units in a single group. And the ability to queue up the training of additional units and upgrades makes it infinitely more convenient to replenish troops in the event that they get wiped out, as well as general ease in multitasking. The variety between races also means that there's no mirroring of missions going on either. In fact, each campaign is tailor-made to accentuate the attributes and unique qualities of each race. For instance, the Night Elves feature several missions with low-capacity gold mines, practically forcing you to move your base from one location to the next. Missions themselves are offered greater plasticity thanks in large part to these racial differences, and the challenges that accompany them are often novel and well-realized. The number of times a mission merely required me to destroy the enemy's base amounted to perhaps two or three times throughout the entire game, and even then there were things to do off to the side that would aid in the process. Maps in general are often quite unique and inventive, especially coupled with the fact that there are usually unique challenges and scenarios in almost every mission. Every location feels unique and purposeful. The layout of each map offering valuable clues regarding your objectives, as well as the multiple paths at your disposal to either advance upon or defend. And since maps are no longer constrained to fit within a strictly square template, any mission style or objective can be suitably paired with a map that befits it, be it big, small, wide, or tall. Each mission has a main objective, sometimes more than one, and many times there are also optional missions to accomplish as well. These are usually unlocked by happening upon NPCs around the map who will offer a reward for some objective or another. It could be going out of your way to kill some strong enemies hidden away in one corner of the map, or it could be to find and retrieve an artifact somewhere, or anything really. And the variety of objectives is met by the variety of rewards, which could be free units, valuable artifacts for your hero, or access to a healing pool, or a merchant store to buy either items or units. Because oh yeah, there are items. Many items are your run-of-the-mill health and mana potions or something to that effect, but there are also items which can cast buffs or debuffs, as well as passive upgrades to armor or attacks of the hero, so long as they remain in the relatively small 6-slot inventory. As you would imagine, managing which items to take with you and which ones to leave or use or save for later or even destroy adds yet another layer of decision making that you'll be confronted with from level to level. And if you're lucky, you may find yourself a tome which straight up upgrades a certain attribute without taking up any inventory spots. But again, you may have more than one hero, so you'll have to decide which hero will take which tome. The two levels of Fog of War are present again, but thanks to the streamlined gameplay, the semi-fog is less obtrusive than before and there's little reason to turn it off this time. I'm not even entirely sure if you can. I didn't even bother to check. It actually fulfills its purpose this time around, and it doesn't feel unfair or distracting in the slightest. Upkeep has been introduced as a new gameplay mechanic, which simply diminishes your resource gathering capabilities if the amount of units you have approaches the capacity of what your farms are able to support. This helps prevent a player from building too large an army and encourages one to actually send units out to battle, because while you may lose some units in the process, you'll also lose a bit of upkeep as well, which you can put towards stronger or more effective units. The balance of army management with resource gathering is of course a critical one, so this added layer of administration that also nudges the player to be less defensive and more active throughout a mission is nothing less than brilliant for introducing further depth and an enhanced pacing of missions. Missions are much more rooted in their surrounding story and the storyline of the game as a whole, tending toward the direction of how Beyond the Dark Portal integrated its story elements with its missions, but now to an even greater degree. Story beats will essentially be taking place right in the middle of missions. The ramifications and consequences of a certain character's actions being immediately felt for what it means for the narrative as well as the gameplay itself. This somewhat distances the connection between the player and the characters that they control, which works in favor of giving these characters a sense of, well, 
character, and their own autonomy that forces the player to submit to their decision and not the other way around. Yet a sense of complacency still lingers as it's ultimately the direct result of the player's command that leads to certain events unfolding, though some less than others. You undoubtedly feel a non-trivial relation with the characters of each campaign, whether you control them or not, because narrative and gameplay have been so resonantly intertwined in a way that makes it feel like they're one. I particularly like that if you think about it, since the Lich King has total control over the Undead, it's almost like you're actually playing as HIM controlling the Undead Legions during the Scourge campaign, which is pretty cool. I kinda wish there were other in-universe reasons for what role you're actually fulfilling within the other campaigns, but it's an understandably tough role to give an in-universe explanation behind. Maybe you really are just a giant metal hand in the sky. I have been chosen by the big metal hand in the sky. Regardless, nothing about the missions feels as though they've been stunted or crammed to fit within the RTS format like how some other game tried to project itself as something it's not, because the folks at Blizzard make Warcraft 3's take on the RTS so much more flexible and malleable with the depth of level design, map diversity, mission structures, and faction distinction. It's abundantly clear that Blizzard waited until they knew the possibilities for what the gameplay was capable of and what it could provide before they made commitments for what the story elements would eventually be, and as such, nothing feels tacked on or strained to fit within a mold that it wasn't meant for. Blizzard knew that an RTS's gameplay could be deeper than just two guys at opposite ends of a map trying to kill each other. You could add flow and pacing, start off with defense and shift halfway through to offense, or inject elements of exploration before progress can be made, or make the whole mission about exploring and micromanaging. You never know what's going to come at you next, and tackling each new challenge or experimenting with old ideas in new ways combined with the silky smooth level of control and navigation makes Warcraft 3 just plain old fun to play. One of the words that best encompasses how all the improvements made to Warcraft 3 interact would be streamlined. Every action, process, and navigational element has been fine-tuned and polished to a degree that feels about as convenient and natural as possible. Such as, for example, the simple convenience of having units automatically get out of the way when you wish to place a building somewhere, enabling autocast abilities for certain units, or how range units typically orient themselves behind melee units in a formation, although that might just be a natural consequence of attack range or movement speed, I don't know. As a sort of funny aside, after a weekend of playing and gathering footage for this video, when I went back to my day job, I caught myself trying to navigate through spreadsheets by brushing the mouse to the edges of the screen. I suppose that speaks volumes to the comfortable and intuitive degree of control that was designed and refined just for this game's camera navigation. And there are so many charming and often subtle touches to the visuals to help distinguish and offer instant visual feedback for just about everything in the game. It goes from obvious things like how units suffering from burns will be on fire, to things like growing in size while berserk, changing specific colors when inhibited by specific debuffs, and even something like how every building has a unique animation to indicate that it's in the process of either researching or training new units. The amount of clear visual feedback and the care to make every animation and effect unique and readable is something that may seem rather obvious, but it's really worth commendation when it's been conducted with the finesse and scope as is visible here. Especially when you consider the amount of diversity between races and how all these visual cues are made compatible across them all. An example of this is how orc riders entrap flying enemies with rope nets, while Scourge Nerubians use webs. They function in the same way, but the effort to make two units that accomplish essentially the same task so distinct from one another yet immediately apparent as to their similarities in combat aptitude is what puts Warcraft 3 way over the top compared to its contemporaries. And it's all those subtleties that lie between races what makes the gradually repeating difficulty scale across campaigns all the more sensible. You go through the human campaign first as a familiar territory to accustom yourself to all the other game-wide changes, then you're thrown into the Scourge, which is a rather drastic departure in its structure. Just about every unit acts in a marginally askew degree from what you're used to. But since you've been fighting them throughout the entire human campaign, you have a general idea for what their capabilities are. Still, going through that slow introduction of units and buildings makes sense and is a welcome learning experience. Orcs and Night Elves follow, and naturally since it's important to know the changes and differences between races, you go through that progression of unlocking units twice more. This does come off as a bit tedious with multiple playthroughs, and this will of course be addressed in the expansion, but on the plus side, missions overall do get a bit more challenging. You'll have to learn how to play your new race quicker than before as the difficulty will come back up to speed in a hurry. When playing on normal difficulty, the game is fairly easy going, you're unlikely to fail most missions, and all you need is a bit of patience and planning. I personally only struggled with the very last level, but that mission is just so naturally fun that finally managing to beat it is more than adequately rewarding, as a final level ought to be. The somewhat relaxed difficulty encourages one to experiment with their strategies without worrying too much about failing a mission. Missions can take anywhere from 20 minutes to around an hour, and finding ways to shave off time, be it by daring or by cunning, can be a satisfying endeavor in and of itself. And of course you have a hard mode to push yourself even further should you so choose. As mentioned previously, I'm one to turtle myself within my base and build up all my units and upgrades before venturing out, which is no doubt an amateur move, but hey, it works. Fortunately, the game introduces missions that exclude that as an option, so that's just another example of how the game can be one step ahead of you and force you to operate out of your comfort zone and make sure you understand alternate ways of going about missions, which is always great to see. From story to difficulty scaling to mission variety to the sheer fun of it all, Warcraft 3 has one of the finest, most enjoyable story modes around, not only in the world of RTS, but in video games, period. So seriously, if you've not played this game before, you're doing yourself a massive disservice. Even for someone who's never been all that into RTSs, this is one I keep coming back to. 
Visually, the game has an instantly recognizable style of character and environmental design, with special mention directed towards the game's use of color. The vibrancy of colors lends itself well to that cartoonish design of the characters, and presents that unmistakable high fantasy impression along with it. This is complemented well with the exaggerated motions of animations strewn about. I never get tired of those massive flappy mouths in character portraits and bouncy flailing nature of most units. Every unit has enough emotive action in their idle animations alone to make them all feel alive, with plenty of creative detail to distinguish them from every other unit even further. There's a razor-thin balance Warcraft tends to walk across between being somewhat playful and comical, but also believable and nuanced in ways that never allows them to detract from serious or tense scenes. It's a balance that's tough to get right, and Warcraft seems to excel at. And special mention is in order for some of the more creative and original elements in general. Orcs, Elves, and a Pantheon of Gods certainly isn't the most original concept for a fantasy world. But the more individual components that make up the inhabitants, and especially the cultures of this world, are certainly diverse and imaginative enough to leave a genuine impression that is unambiguously Warcraft. Sound design also deserves plenty of praise on its own. Plenty of sound effects and voice lines have burned themselves into my brain and fit in effortlessly with the overall character of the game as a whole. There's not a man alive who's played through this game and can't instantly recite the dialogue exchange between Arthas and Uther from The Culling by heart, or one of its many parodies. Again, notable distinctions are present in all the sound effects to add that extra bit of recognition to inform a player what unit is doing what. Be it attacking, moving, casting a spell, or what have you. And they're all just really well produced and recognizable sounds. I don't really know what else to say, but I just really, really like the sound design of this game. Except for the gyrocopters. Music-wise, the game has taken on a more orchestral and symphonic motif, and each race gets their own variations on themes which embody their particular qualities. This does kind of mean that there's less of anything that's super memorable or able to get stuck in your head, but it's still really well made nonetheless and sells all the right moods and atmospheres. Warcraft 3 just oozes personality and charm in its visual and audio design in a way that no other game has ever really tried to imitate. And what review of Warcraft 3 would be complete without mention of those wonderful cinematic cutscenes? Warcraft and Blizzard in general have become well known for their incredibly well produced and detailed cinematic cutscenes over the years, and this is definitely an occasion where that really shows. Of course, the visuals have become less impressive over the years, but when the game first released and when I personally first played through the game, these cutscenes blew me away with how amazing they looked. Without a doubt, one of my fondest memories of this game is watching the Arthas' Betrayal cutscene, and it still stands today as one of my favorite video game cutscenes ever, despite how simple it is. These were like miniature movies you got as a reward for completing a campaign, and it definitely worked because nothing motivated me to play more than unlocking and watching the next cutscene. And thankfully, only a couple of them sucked. But it's also important to remember that this was a time where cinematics of this caliber weren't at all common amongst games in any capacity. Nowadays, it seems every AAA game has to have at least one or two overproduced cinematics to announce and or sell their game instead of, you know, showing what the game actually is like. But let's not go down that path right now. Okay, what else is there? Um... There's multiplayer. I... Haven't played it. Uh, it's probably good. And I know there's like a billion and a half mods out for this game too that can shake it up and basically create entire new games. But honestly, Warcraft 3 is just so freaking good on its own that I've never even had the slightest interest in trying those out either. And yeah, yeah, it was a Warcraft 3 mod that created Dota, which eventually got spun off into a full game that became one of the biggest competitive games of all time. But honestly, I just don't care. Maybe this will be an unpopular perspective, but playing through Warcraft 3's campaign leaves me feeling happy and satisfied. It's so good that I can play it, put it down, and say, that was good, and then move on with the feeling that I've gotten all I could have ever wanted out of it, with no regrets. I know that some people only play Warcraft 3 exclusively for the multiplayer and the mods, and they really love it, and probably wish I wouldn't just gloss over it, and I'm really sorry to those people. I'm happy that you're happy with that part of the game, but it just doesn't interest me. Conversely, some people don't care about the campaigns, and that's fine too. Maybe I'm a bad reviewer because I choose to flat out ignore a part of the game that many would consider critical or defining, and I don't want to undermine all the hard work that the folks at Blizzard and modders have put into it, but that's not why I bought the game, and it's not something I care enough to which I can give a fair or proper analysis. It's there if you want it, and I've heard nothing but good things about it, but that's all I can say. Now, I racked my brains for a good long while to think of any faults or shortcomings to say about this game, and obviously no game is perfect, but... I have to say... This one's pretty close. Apart from maybe a soundtrack that's decidedly less catchy than previous installments, although that's not necessarily a bad thing, some missions that I may be a bit lukewarm on, and a few story elements that definitely seem a bit undercooked or trite. It's a genuine struggle to find anything about this game that could be considered inarguably bad or poorly implemented. Maybe you could make a case for all the pop culture references that units make when you click on them enough, and as the years go by some of the quotes won't fare quite as well as the others, but so far 17 and a half years after release, I haven't found any of them to be particularly objectionable. I'll attract the enemy with my human call. I'm so wasted! I'm so wasted! Unlike many games today, where the references are all too often already long dead flash in the pan internet jokes. But even so, I think all these references act as a sort of time capsule for what was popular during release. I'll take the rapist for 500. 
That's Therapist. Warcraft 3 constantly mixes and remixes new elements in ways that seem neither unintuitive nor mere novelties. It introduces challenge in all the right ways without being overly punishing or unfair, offers variety and opportunities for different ways to play or approach multiple situations. Every element is well-defined, displayed, and utilized in a balanced and worthwhile manner. You cannot play this game and not have fun. It's impossible. I ran the numbers twice, checked them thrice, peer-reviewed, meta-analysis, independent reaffirmation across multivariate and aggregate sources. It's a fact. Now, in the previous two videos, I covered what happened during the missions that made up the story because I felt that exactly what happened in those games was relatively obscure, and now it's time to do the same thing for this game, not only for consistency's sake, but also because I think it's handy to have a nice video summary like this. But I should mention, especially with Reforged being out, the story for this game is much more accessible and entertaining to experience on your own. So if you still have intentions to play and haven't yet, this is your last chance to do so. Because everything after this has story spoilers. Otherwise, if you'd like to skip this part for any other reason, here's the time code to jump to Frozen Throne. So the game starts off with a cinematic of an orc and a human fighting, and then teases the fact that there's a new threat to the world of Azeroth, far greater than the dispute between orcs and humans. Once you start the prologue slash tutorial campaign, the game starts off with a cinematic of an army of orcs and humans fighting, and then teases the fact that there is a new threat to the world of Azeroth far greater than the petty dispute between orcs and humans. Then a mysterious hooded figure calls for you to lead the horde to their destiny. You in this case being Thrall having a bad dream. Thrall is told by the hooded crow man to follow him and learn the fate of his people, and after doing so is told to gather his people and escape to Kalimdor, which is this place over here. Thrall agrees for literally no reason other than that he has nothing better to do. But the spirits tell me that I should trust him. And then Thrall goes out to rescue Grom Hellscream, and they steal some boats to sail to Kalimdor, and that's the end of the prologue. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the human capital, the top brass are bickering about the orcs and the plague when the prophet shows up to warn them of a coming threat, and that they should leave for Kalimdor too. And the humans are super sensible and see the wisdom in his words, and agree to drop everything they fought to preserve and venture out to the untamed wilds, and no, of course not, they tell him to buzz off and he mutters some edgy remarks as he grumbles away as if he expected they'd be as stupid. I mean, as desperate as the orcs. Anyway, our golden boy wonder Arthas joins up with his mentor Uther, and he tells Arthas to defend the town of Strongbad, I mean Stronbrad, from some marauding orcs while he heads out for some other front. After defending the town, Arthas rejoins Uther at the Black Rock encampment, and they tag team together to defeat the orcs who are attempting to sacrifice humans for their demon masters or something. Out at Dalaran, the prophet is ineffectively trying to persuade the head of the Kirin Tor, Antonidas, but is once again turned down. After this, Antonidas sends Jaina Proudmore off to investigate the nature of the rumored plague, so she meets up with Arthas to escort her around the nearby villages. They encounter a few undead and come to discover that the plague has been spreading by way of infected grain. The two make their way to Anderhal and encounter the necromancer Kel'Thuzad who has been spreading the plagued grain, and he informs our heroes about his master Mal'Ganis, who is allegedly the source behind the plague's creation. As a means of thanks, they kill him, but being a part of a death cult, he doesn't really seem to mind. Afterwards, A and J make it to Hearthglen in time to learn of an oncoming army of undead, and Arthas sends Jaina to get reinforcements from Uther. Arthas defends the town and destroys as many convoys of tainted grain as possible in order to stay the spreading plague, as he waits for Uther to eventually arrive just as the assault is at its apex. And so now Arthas is just flat out offended by the plague's very existence, and he gets so miffed about how ineffectual he is against it himself that he decides to express his frustration by getting more and more rude to his friends for not being as angry about it as he is. Anyway, he stomps off towards Stratholm in order to confront Mal'Ganis. On his way there, the Prophet tries to convince Arthas to leave for Kalimdor too. Arthas doesn't care, although Jaina isn't quite so sure about dismissing him. Once they make it to Stratholm, Arthas sees that everyone is already infected, and decides the only thing he can do is kill all the people before the infection can kill and reanimate them. Uther objects, and is dismissed from service. Jaina leaves too, as she's too disgusted by what Arthas intends to do. So Arthas and Mal'Ganis have a contest to see who can kill 100 innocent people the fastest, a contest that Arthas wins. Mal'Ganis runs away and tells Arthas to meet him at Northrend, which is up here, to fulfill his true destiny or something. And Arthas is obviously so peeved at this point that he just takes the bait. Afterwards, Jaina sees the result of Arthas's actions and is horrified, and then the Prophet confronts her to finally successfully convince somebody else to head out to Kalimdor. Arthas lands at Northrend and is in the process of setting up a base and exploring a bit when he runs into an old dwarf friend, Murden, who was part of an expedition crew to search out a legendary sword known as Frostmourne. The two team up to establish themselves in the Frozen Land and help each other out with their quests. However, after setting up camp, a messenger arrives with a message from the king to abandon their hunt and return to Lordaeron. Arthas doesn't want to leave, so he enlists the help of some mercenaries to run around and destroy the boats before his men can get to them, and then he has the mercenaries killed to incur the ire of his troops against the enemy, and leave them no other choice but to press onwards towards victory, even though he loudly and clearly announced his plans to destroy the boats himself right in front of the captain. Anyway, Arthas and Muradin head into a cave to locate Frostmourne. Once they find it, they see that the blade has a curse which enslaves the soul of whoever wields it, a sacrifice Arthas is willing to make in exchange for the power it brings. Muradin, who has been super disappointed by Arthas' actions up to this point, by the way, gets killed by the exploding ice prison of the sword as it's unleashed. 
After a good long battle, Arthas confronts Malganus, who is pleased to see that Arthas is now under control of the Dark Lord, whose voice exists within Frostmourne. However, is shocked to be betrayed when the voice orders Arthas to fulfill his vengeance and kill Malganus. Arthas, now totally corrupted by the will of the spirit being channeled through Frostmourne, which is the Lich King near Zul if he hadn't figured it out, returns to Lordaeron for a hero's welcome, as they believe he has returned in victory. Only Arthas has instead come in service of Ner'zhul, and kills his own father the king to topple the order he once belonged to, and bring about the rule of his new master. Just a note, I used to think Arthas' fall was tragic, but upon replay I realized that he never once showed any degree of restraint or piety despite being a high-ranking paladin, and was 100% motivated by revenge the whole time, so it's pretty easy to see why the Lich King chose him as a champion since he was fairly rotten to begin with. A lot like Kel'Thuzad, actually. But anyway, we can move right along to the Scourge. The Scourge campaign begins right where the human campaign ends, once again focusing on Arthas, only this time as a Death Knight rather than a Paladin. Arthas is called by another Dreadlord named Tychondrius to sneak about some human towns and gather up some acolytes in hiding. After doing so, Arthas and his minions head to Anderhal to collect the remains of Kel'Thuzad with the intent to resurrect him. In order to transport the remains safely, Arthas needs a special urn which currently contains his father's ashes and is under the protection of the Paladins and Uther. So one by one, Arthas kills all the Paladins and Uther to claim the urn and presumably piss on his father's ashes. Kel'Thuzad's spirit also informs Arthas that the Dreadlords are still their enemy as they are acting as jailers to the Lich King. Somewhere in the Twisting Nether, several Dreadlords confer with each other and are already suspecting that the Lich King is conspiring against them and their master, Archimonde. We'll get to him later. Arthas is on his way to Quel'Thalas' capital in order to gain access to enough magical power to resurrect Kel'Thuzad. In the run-up through the forests, Arthas encounters a pesky elf general named Sylvanas who attempts to thwart him a number of times, but Arthas is ultimately able to advance against her through to the city of Silvermoon. Once in the city, Arthas is able to confront and defeat Sylvanas, though rather than kill her, he rips her spirit from her body to become a banshee to serve him. Which, fun fact, is an optional quest. You could theoretically just ignore her and leave her alive and well. Anyway, eventually Arthas makes it to the Wellspring and resurrects Kel'Thuzad. They wander off to have a chat where Kel'Thuzad tells Arthas that the Scourge are acting as temporary servants of the Burning Legion, which is on its way to invade all of Azeroth. Arthas fights through some of the orcs so Kel'Thuzad can use a gate to talk to Archimonde for their next instructions, which, as it happens, is to reclaim one of the books of Medivh, which is hidden away at Dalaran, for use in summoning Archimonde himself into their world. So Arthas storms Dalaran and slays his way through the Kirin Tor, eventually making his way to Antonidas, killing him too, and claiming the book. That very night, Kel'Thuzad begins his incantation to summon Archimonde, while Arthas fends off the remaining Kirin Tor for 30 actual minutes. Archimonde is eventually summoned, and decides he has no further use for the Lich King, so he changes command of the Scourge from the Lich King to the Dreadlords, even though that's pretty much how it seemed to work out already. But anyway, now Arthas and Kel'Thuzad are able to slink away and go about bolstering the Lich King's power on their own, now that their duties to Archimonde and the Legion are essentially finished. As a display of his power, Archimonde builds the magic sandcastle city of Dalaran, and then crushes it, which also crushes the real life city. But I'm pretty sure everyone inside was dead already. Oh well, on to the orcs. The orcs have landed in Kalimdor, but Thrall and Grom have been separated. As Thrall searches for Grom, he meets a native Tauren chieftain named Cairn, who tells of an oracle who may provide answers for what is to be the Horde's destiny. Thrall offers to help protect Cairn's tribe from marauding centaurs in exchange for information of where to find the oracle, to which Cairn agrees. After a long journey, Cairn reveals that the oracle is located at Stone Talon Peak near the base of Mount Hyjal, and the two separate. Meanwhile in Lordaeron, Tychondrius meets up with another demon known as the Pit Lord named Manoroth, who is the demon responsible for the original invasion of the orcs, and is displeased by the fact that the orcs were unable to accomplish what the Scourge now has, and wishes to punish them. Wait, I thought bringing the orcs into the fold was Kill Jaden's idea when he talked to Gul'dan, you know? Ah well. Anyway, Tychondrius informs Manoroth that the orcs have gone to Kalimdor, and Archimonde arrives to state that the orcs may still have a part in their plans. Back in Kalimdor, Thrall's company meets up with Grom, who is battling some humans who have also made their way to the continent under Jaina's command. The two join forces and defend themselves against the humans long enough to secure some goblin zeppelins to fly their way across the terrain. Grom is a bit too violent against the humans for Thrall's liking, so he sends them off to build a settlement while he and his men go out to search for the oracle. As Grom sets about collecting enough lumber to build the settlement, he encounters the night elves who combat him against his clearing of their forests, but he ultimately defeats them in order to secure the lumber. Manoroth and Tychondrius arrive in Kalimdor, but because they were beset by Cenarius in the past, they are required to destroy him before the rest of the Legion can invade Kalimdor. Since Grom's desecration of the forest has incurred the ire of Cenarius, Tychondrius has Manoroth poison a well with his blood in order to lure the orcs to drink of it for its power, and get them to kill Cenarius for them. Down at Grom's encampments, Cenarius begins his destruction of the settlements and nearly defeats them. However, Grom learns of the poison pool. They find the pool and Grom willingly re-enters the Pact of the Demons in order to gain its power. With their new strength, Grom is able to stand against and defeat Cenarius. Afterward, Grom encounters Manoroth and wishes to resist, but has no choice but to serve him once again. Meanwhile, Thrall has reached the base of Stone Talon, but human encampments prevent them from reaching the Oracle. Karen rejoins Thrall to help them defeat the humans, which they do so. As they approach the cave, Thrall sees Jaina enter the cave first, before entering himself. 
Karen and Thrall split up to make their way through the caves and converge at the end to encounter Jaina. Before they can clash arms, however, the Oracle, aka the Prophet, makes himself known. He informs Thrall of the Burning Legion's invasion of Lordaeron, Grom's fall into demon hands, and now he must team up with Jaina to stop them before they can take over Kalimdor as well. Jaina provides Thrall a mystical soul gem to capture Grom and release him from the demons' control. Thrall and the humans fight through the demonic Warsong's army to collect Grom's soul and bring it back to their base to return him to normal. Grom tells Thrall that the orcs willingly gave themselves to Manoroth's control in the beginning, just as he did this time again. But once back to normal, he agrees to join Thrall to take down Manoroth together. In the battle, Thrall is knocked aside, but Grom is able to cut through Manoroth's armor and kill him. In death, Manoroth explodes, and the fires that spew forth end up mortally wounding Grom, who makes a speech about how he and the orcs are finally free of their demonic pact as he dies before Thrall. Tyronda, you remember her, right? Has been watching over the forest, and has a distaste for the orcs and humans' encampments in the forest. So she starts fighting them to take back the forest. During their battle, the demons begin invading, and Tyronda retreats. She comes face to face with Archimonde, who sees that he's returned, but is able to hide herself to avoid getting killed. Once Archimonde is gone, she stealths her way through the forest to warn Negus Sylvanas of the coming legion. In order to defend their lands, Tyronda sets out to awaken the sleeping druids and her lover, Furion, for aid. She battles her way through the forests to claim and blow an awakening horn before the undead can reach and destroy the resting Furion. Once awakened, Furion dispels the currently invading undead and meets with Tyronda to learn of the death of Cenarius and the return of the legion. Furion foresees Archimonde's plan to climb Mount Hyjal and destroy the world tree, but there are still other druids left to awaken. The two battle through more forests to reach the Barrow Dens where the druids of the Talon lie and awaken them. But there are still more druids beneath the ground left to awaken. So they travel through some caves and wake them up too. Through their travels they find the path to Illidan's prison, and Tyronda splits to rescue him against Furion's wishes. The druids of the Kalar are awakened at about the same time that Illidan is freed, and they all meet up for a big family reunion and a group hug. Actually, Illidan is a little bit bitter about the crick in his neck from his 10,000 year imprisonment, but says he'll still help, though Furion still refuses to fight with him. Illidan desperately wants to prove to his brother just how strong he is and how he's beyond the demons' control. Arthas arrives to say something cryptic and they start to fight for some reason, but neither can best the other. Arthas tells Illidan that his new master knew of Illidan's desire for power and that the demons possess the skull of Gul'dan, which is responsible for the poisoning of his forests, and that Illidan could claim it for himself to save the forest and grant him the power he desires, which Arthas then asks him to use to kill Tychondrius for him. So Illidan grabs the skull and crushes it to absorb its power, which turns him into something of a dreadlord himself. He then uses his newfound power to confront and destroy Tychondrius. After this, Furion and Tyrande approach him to braid him for trading his soul for power and banish him from the forest, to which Illidan decides to accept and wanders off. The Prophet summons Furion and Tyrande to a meeting place, where eventually Thrall and Jaina arrive as well. The Prophet arrives and reveals that he was responsible for the Legion's return, for his true identity is Medivh, the one who opened the portal for the Orcs' original invasion, and he has returned to right his wrongs. And so he has brought our heroes together so that their combined efforts can triumph against Archimonde. The three races build a defense along the path of the World Tree, and fight together to stall the progression of Archimonde's ascent for 45 actual minutes while Furion's final defense gathers at the top of the mountain, which involves something about the Night Elves giving up their immortality and power over nature. I don't exactly know why, because that power is linked to the tree, and as long as it still stands, they should be fine, but whatever. So after the Legion is delayed long enough, Archimonde finishes his climb to the tree, where he's about to destroy it before being overwhelmed by thousands of wisps who all simultaneously detonate themselves to destroy Archimonde and save the world. After this, Medivh says some hopeful words about the state of the world and goes off to disappear now that his task as the last guardian has been completed. You know, because remember his mom was a guardian? Okay, the end. Game over. So that's Reign of Chaos, and you can no doubt tell the astonishing jump in quality between Warcraft 2 and this. Where Warcraft 2 was mostly about running around to kill guys and get a thing, this game is a lot more focused on doing things that make sense for the plot, like destroying grain shipments or exploring dungeons or just trying to survive against an ever-increasing onslaught of enemies. Not only that, but the characters have actual character, not super deep or nuanced character or anything, but enough to make them recognizable and their actions understood. Uther's staunt, pious honor shines with every line of dialogue he has like the reflection of divine light off his armor, compared to Kurdran, whose defining character trait was, is on a griffin and gets captured by dragons. Wow. And of course, as previously mentioned, the narrative flows from one campaign through to the next, and the scope of the building threat is revealed to us along with it. First it seems like Malganus is the main bad guy, but then maybe Tychondrius and the other dreadlords. Then finally we learn about Archimonde. But even though there's this one overarching bad guy, each campaign has their own personal threats. Humans have Malganus, Scourge has the humans, Orcs have to fight basically everyone including themselves, but generally speaking have Manoroth as their main villain, even though you don't actually get to fight him. And then finally the Night Elves primarily fight the demons and actually encounter Archimonde as their final threat. But since Archimonde is the enemy of all, you all band together in the end. Except the Lich King, probably because he had a cold or something. It's not quite as simple as all that though, but that's a good thing. These characters all have pasts, and they can't just brush aside their grievances at the drop of a hat so they can unite to face one big baddie with the power of friendship. There's multiple weaving designs and motivations because everyone is trying to put themselves or their people in an advantageous position beyond just the current threat. 
And that threat is more than just one Grand Master with a Lieutenant and a bunch of lackeys. There's actually some variety of baddies of varying status, most of whom have their own personalities to contrast our heroes, but not all. So when you get the chance to kill one, you get the feeling like it genuinely meant something and had an effect on the world and story. Especially if it was one of the good guys that used to be your friend, but definitely not this random elf girl who you forgot about three seconds later. So it's overall a really satisfying story that fleshes out the world, factions, characters, locations, and histories, and tells a story that builds well across four distinct perspectives and resolves satisfyingly with only a few intentionally loose ends. You really couldn't ask for much more, except for more of it. So, on July 1st, 2003, Blizzard granted that request and released the Frozen Throne, a simulator and expansion to the base game where they decided not to fix what wasn't broken and just gave us more of everything in the form of two augmented-ish factions and three new campaigns into which we could all sink our collective teeth. Those of us interested in the story mode at least, but by all accounts it was a fruitful expansion for everyone, especially Blizzard who sold a million copies in a month and a half, which is a big deal back then because it basically did just as well as the base game. Before we get into it though, we might as well quickly cover the new backstory which is, thankfully, really short. It's so short in fact that it only takes up one side of a page in the manual and rather than needing to summarize, I can just read it to you verbatim. If you want to save yourself 30 seconds, you can skip it, but otherwise, here it is. Many months have passed since Archimonde and the Burning Legion were defeated at the Battle of Mount Hyjal. The stalwart elves led by the archdruid Malfurion Stormrage and the priestess Tyronda Whisperwind have vanished back into the shadows of Ashenvale Forest, intent on healing the ancient lands that were scarred by the Legion's vile corruption. The battle-weary Orcish Horde, led by the idealistic Warchief Thrall, has settled in the harsh eastern hills of the Kalimdor Barrens. Finally able to claim a homeland of their own, the Orcs work tirelessly to found and protect their new nation of Durotar. The human survivors of Lordaeron, under the command of the sorceress Jaina Proudmoore, have to safeguard the ragtag remnants of the failing human alliance. And Arthas, the newly crowned king of Lordaeron, has driven the undead scourge to eradicate the last vestiges of resistance to his iron rule. His kingdom, the once proud bastion of human might and nobility, has become a plagued realm of death and sorrow. Now driven by haunting visions of the frozen throne of Icecrown, Arthas plans to tighten his grip over the rest of the world. Still, one dark soul remains at large, for in some shadowed corner in the world, the wayward creature known as Illidan Stormrage plots and waits. The end. Yeah, pretty much everything you already knew or could have guessed, right? The game picks up just barely after where the last left off, which was to be expected. So we can go ahead and dive right into what's new in the expansion. Well, not a whole lot, but certainly enough in fresh content alone that it's more than worth your while. The three new campaigns plus the bonus campaign take up about an equal amount of time as the original four. What must be addressed first and foremost is the NEW factions, and I put quotations around the word NEW because while the Naga are most like a whole new playable force, they and the Blood Elves are more ancillary, and by that I mean they get tacked on to previously established factions. There aren't any missions where you play solely as the Naga, and the Blood Elves are either an addition to standard human forces, or are an impaired version of humans that may or may not be joined by the Naga. I get the sense that you're still confused. All I mean is that the humans have new Blood Elf units that sometimes replace old human units, but for much of the Alliance campaign you don't really have access to most of the classic human units such as knights or dwarves and stuff, just the units that the elves occupy like sorcerers and the good old archers who make a return from Warcraft 2. And this is something of a running theme. A lot of what the expansion has to offer is, rather than just giving you the units for a given race all at once and making a bunch of missions with the setup like Beyond the Dark Portal, Instead, the game selectively gives and takes away certain units that may or may not be slightly altered from the base game, and you just have to work with what you got. But you may also be paired with another faction's units, and you can mix and match the two to get the best of both for your purposes. All that in addition to a few new hero units with whom you'll have the pleasure of getting accustomed. This is a really neat setup because it can force you into using tactics or experimenting with certain units in ways that you wouldn't normally do, and this is best exemplified in one of the Scourge missions where you control three separate heroes and their associated units. So Arthas has the heavy, tanking abominations, Kel'Thuzad has skeletons summoning necromancers, and Sylvanas has unit-stealing banshees, and you need to operate each one effectively all at the same time to be able to complete the mission. And the way it's structured, with humans trying to evacuate through exits behind each hero, you can't just pick your favorite and go through the whole mission like that. You need to keep each exit prepared and operational to fend off the waves of humans while also venturing forth to take out their settlements. It's a tough mission, but you can bet you'll know the strengths, weaknesses, and effective strategies for each of those units now. And that's more or less how the entire expansion is laid out. You get a few units to play around with and you're forced into creatively conceived missions that leave little to no room for sitting around and building up upgrades. 
A good many missions are on a timer of some kind, or split your forces in half, so you can't really rely on upgrades to roll in before you take any action, because if you don't take the proper offensive measures, you'll just be steamrolled by the steady stream of enemies coming at your bases from multiple directions. It's a lot more advantageous to venture out and defeat an enemy encampment rather than try to hold your base on two or more fronts. So if you've learned how to use your units effectively, you can actually make a mission easier and shorter for yourself just by being a little bold. If you want room to breathe, you have to take it because it's not given to you. As was the case with much of Reign of Chaos, most missions with a base element start you off with most of your base fully built up and ready to go, with perhaps only a couple buildings left to be built by you if you want them. There's a much heavier focus on how you use your units rather than how you lay out your base, although there are still some missions that sprinkle that around too, especially if you need to set up more than one base. Most obvious of this expansion's unit focus is the numerous missions without a base or with base functionality out of your control, requiring your attention towards directing what units you have to find more or, again, just working with what you got. It takes a lot of the busy work that was so heavily present in the first two games and shears it aside to plop you straight into a scenario that you can immediately begin to work your way through. You can't run into a rut of repeating the same strategies from mission to mission because all the missions are wildly different and availability of certain elements isn't guaranteed. There are a fair degree more dungeon exploration based missions, and with them an uptick of fairly shallow but notable degree of puzzle solving that more often than not will give you a nice item or extra handheld unit for your hero to carry, these somewhat appeared in the base game but it's a lot more prevalent here. Usually these puzzles are just a button or lever that needs to be pressed, and it's nice how it forces you to examine your surroundings a bit more closely and poke around a bit. I especially like how Maiev's blink ability is used to reach otherwise inaccessible corners for some bonus goodies. In addition to her, I think all the new hero units in this expansion are fun to play around with and offer some valuable, unique abilities that really help add a little extra spice to the already well-seasoned missions. Some additional seasonings would be the runes that mostly replace potions by just giving you the health and mana instantly rather than making you fumble around with your tiny inventory, and a shop building for each faction where you can buy some items if you need them that I never use, but hey, it's there if you want it. And of course, there's all that you would expect when you hear the word expansion. New areas, enemies, allies, items, and abilities. Oh, and uh... <laughs> Yeah, the boats are back, but thankfully they're not an integral part of the game in any way. They just pop up in a couple missions where you gotta destroy like one or two enemy boats and move your units across a river. No oil, no naval buildings, you just walk up, buy a boat, use it for two minutes, and then you're on your way. Oh yeah, and they don't take up any food. You could almost forget that they were even included at all. I'm no less disinclined towards them because they still complicate the process of going from point A to B, but if they had to be here, they're acceptably implemented at least. Especially with regard to the fact that you now have mutant fish elves and you want to give them a terrestrial advantage of some kind. In addition to the three main campaigns, you also have access at any time to a bonus horde campaign where you take control of a half-orc, half-ogre hero named Rexar, and can basically run freely around multiple connected maps to complete a variety of story and optional missions, and just explore as you will, picking up other heroes as you go. It's almost like Warcraft and World of Warcraft merged into one. It's very focused on RPG-like elements where you complete missions for more XP and better gear, and then just explore around areas for goodies with multiple members joining and leaving your party. Honestly, this didn't really appeal to me all that much. It got pretty tedious and monotonous running around with the same three units and fetching MacGuffins over and over again. You get pretty overpowered pretty quickly, so you just end up walking up to enemies and spamming the same few abilities over and over again. And then the only way that the game tries to compensate for this is just by throwing a million enemies at you at once. You can't lose, as your heroes will respawn instantly for free, so you can just keep throwing them at it and picking away enemies until you win. There's a few good moments here and there, and an interesting bonus story to go along with it to explain what the Horde's been getting up to. It tries to take the hero mechanic and turn that into its own sort of game, but for my money it wasn't very successful. Sort of Diablo-esque now that I think about it, but not nearly as fun. This kind of off-the-beaten-path gameplay is good enough when explored in bursts like in the main campaigns, but not quite as welcome when stretched out and prolonged with nothing but the same 3-4 to four units to go through it all. Still, it was a worthwhile take, and being a bonus campaign allows the proper perspective to suggest that this model of gameplay was only a bit of novel experimentation, and even though it may not have hit the mark, doesn't mean the game is overall lesser for it. But that more or less concludes what there is to say about the Frozen Thrones gameplay. It's a built-upon, even more polished version of the base game. Though perhaps a bit more gimmicky, focusing heavily on taking the Warcraft 3 setup and cheating it a bit to create missions that are almost like individualized minigames and have less in common with their classic RTS origins. But that's not to say that it's lost its way, as there's still plenty of good old-fashioned RTS gameplay to be had intermingled between. Frozen Throne is like a goodie bag of, what about if we tried this ideas from developers that all got put together to show off the near limitless possible ways to take the game's core and use it to create original and innovative gameplay styles. 
It expands the scope of what you know and love, and introduces new ways to play with the rules as unique but still well-made and implemented scenarios that, to me, are more like refreshing reprieves to the standard, more traditional fares that you see in the base game. Though admittedly at times, it can seem a bit thrown off from the focus the game was originally geared towards, in favor of doing something different just for the sake of it. But in the end, I think it still stands just as tall as the base game, more as a different flavor of Warcraft rather than a wholly iterative expansion. Gets the game looking good and trim with an extra layer of polish, then puts it through a series of fun outfits and exclaims, Oh my god, that top is so you. It's experimental, but doesn't fly off the rails with it, although the experimentation makes it slightly more divisive than the base game, and you may or may not appreciate the eclectic shifting gameplay to us that get thrown at you mission to mission. But I'd still say Blizzard was tactful and intelligent about how they structured and played around with every mission, and overall it's just as much of a blast to play through as the base game, with an extra notch or two of difficulty to boot. Some of the missions, especially towards the end of the Scourge campaign, are really quite challenging. So challenging, in fact, that I consulted the strategy guide a few times to help me through them. My previous strategy of turtling in my base and slowly moving forward is rapidly thwarted when I have multiple bases that need to square off against multiple enemy bases, so no matter what, my attention has to be split. And credit where it's due, I genuinely found most of the tips in the guide helpful. It's well written and gives practical advice, but naturally leaves most of the specifics to your own discretion, so it gets a thumbs up from me. Thanks, Bart. But with all that said and done, it once again brings us back to the story of the game, which I will again be summarizing the events of here before giving my thoughts. So here's the timecode to skip it if you'd like, otherwise you can just sit back and relax. We're introduced to a night elf warden named Meryl, I mean Maiev, who was previously in charge of overseeing Illidan's imprisonment, but now that he's been freed, she's currently on the hunt to capture and detain him once again. As she follows his trail, she discovers that Illidan's corrupted nature has a noticeably ill effect on some of the local fauna, and that a race of fish snake people called the Naga have allied with him. Illidan escapes on a boat, and Maiev boards her own to give chase. Maiev arrives at a chain of islands out at sea somewhere, and after helping an orc hermit learns that he is Drakthul and was once a warlock of the Stormreaver clan, and that these were the islands that contained the tomb of Sargeras where Gul'dan and the rest of his clan were slain by demons. Maiev eventually catches up to Illidan in time to see him enter the tomb, then takes out his guards to follow after him. Inside the tomb, Maiev discovers runes that recount Colonel Cam Gul'dan's ill-fated journey to search for an artifact known as the Eye of Sargeras. At one point, she encounters a Naga witch named Lady Vaj, who informs her that the Naga are, in fact, what some of the Highborn Elves became after the destruction of the Well of Eternity, which explains why they're with Illidan now, since he was on their side way back when. Anyway, Maiev encounters Illidan just as he claims the Eye of Sargeras and initiates the collapse of the tomb. Maiev, being the only one capable of teleportation, is forced to abandon her comrades in order to escape. After escaping, Maiev sends a runner to sail back to Kalimdor to warn Furion of Illidan's shenanigans and request reinforcements. The runner reaches Furion and Tyrande, who both go to join up with Maiev, who's slightly incensed with Tyrande for freeing Illidan in the first place. They beat back and catch up to Illidan, who tells them he's serving a new master now before running away again, and they continue their chase by boat. The three eventually land at Lordaeron, and Furion leaves to commune with the forest, while Maiev and Tyrande continue to search for Illidan. They encounter a high elf named Jack Kael'thas, who is on the run to protect his people, whom he has dubbed Blood Elves from the Scourge. They agree to help each other out by escorting Kale's people to safety in exchange for assistance in the hunt for Illidan. Just at the end of their journey, Tyrande attempts the super tactical Warcraft 1 bridge control strategy, which is successful up until the bridge is destroyed and she's washed downstream. Meanwhile, Furion learns from the spirits that the world is being shaken apart near Northrend, and it's due to a spell being cast by Illidan. When he meets with Maiev, she tells him Tyrande is absolutely 100% for sure dead, and they work with Kale to stop Illidan's spell before it can be completed. After which Illidan is about to be executed, but Furion learns that Maiev lied to him and that Tyrande might still be alive. So Furion agrees to let Illidan live long enough to rescue her. And so Illidan battles through undead and manages to save Tyrande and bring her to safety. After which Furion pardons Illidan's crimes for some reason. Even though he clearly isn't going to just stop and openly admits that he wants more power. Illidan leaves through a portal, but Maiev, not being quite as stupid, arrives to chase after him. But before we can see what happens, the game shifts gears to the- our new golden boy wonder, Prince Kael'thas, meets with his commanding officer and humanitarian, the N. Garethos. Sorry, if you couldn't tell, our gal Chris is at it again. Anyway, Kale is reprimanded for being late and then ordered to fix up some observatories while Garethos and the real men go out to the battlefronts. During their mission, Kael'thas encounters Lady Vaj, who offers him some ships due to their distant kinship and common enemy, the Scourge. After completing his task, Kale is again reprimanded by Garethos for accepting aid from the inhuman Naga. Afterwards, Kale is tasked with destroying an undead encampment. However, due to Garethos pulling all his heavy infantry, he's quickly overrun and is forced to ally with the Naga again, who aid him in pushing back against the undead. Garethos returns to catch Kale red-handed in his serpentine collusion and has him taken away to be executed for his treasonous actions. 
Lady Vaj then breaks Kale out of prison and they gather their comrades to escape the prison and enter the portal that Kel'Thuzad opened way back when to bring Archimon to their world. There's also a bonus mission where you have to hold off Garethos' forces with some... Wait a minute. I thought I was playing Warcraft, not a tower defense game. Huh. Uh, okay. The world everyone arrives in is the destroyed world of Draenor, now known as Outland. The duo begin their search for Illidan and soon find him captured in a cage by Maiev. Kale, Vaj, and, if you completed the bonus mission, a drunk panda named Kesha, fight off Maiev's forces in a game of tug-of-war to drag the cage back to their base and free Illidan. Illidan accepts Kael'thas and his people into his fold and informs him that he has accepted a bargain with Kil'jaeden to destroy the Lich King by melting the ice caps and destroying the Frozen Throne. But after being thwarted, he ran to Outland to avoid Kil'jaeden's wrath. Before he can get too cozy, he needs to rid the planet of a pit lord named Megtheridon who commands the remaining orcs on the world. But before he can confront him, he needs to close the other dimensional gates that Ner'zhul opened to stop any demonic reinforcements from coming through. So one by one, the crew set about closing the gates and even ally with the native Draenei and their leader Akama, who aren't nearly as photogenic as their MMO counterparts. I'm sure there's an explanation for this that goes something like blah 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 corruption blah blah blah. Illidan, the Naga, Blood Elves, and Draenei storm make Theridon's keep to take down his minions and dethrone him. Afterwards, Illidan claims lordship over all of Outland, but his antics don't go unseen by Kil'jaeden, who promptly appears and scolds Illidan for his failure and attempts to hide. Illidan claims he was just bolstering his forces, and Kil'jaeden allows him one last chance to destroy the Frozen Throne with the help of his new companions. And so ends the, uh, alliance campaign. I guess it's something of a new alliance. Back at Lordaeron, the now King Arthas approaches some Dreadlords to notify them that the Legion has been defeated and that he's coming for them next. The Dreadlords run away and Arthas reunites with Kel'Thuzad and Sylvanas. They decide their first order of business is to cleanse the land of any mortal presence by splitting up and destroying any and all settlements and remaining paladins. While on the task, Ner'zhul speaks to Arthas to tell him that the Frozen Throne is at risk of destruction and to return to Northrend immediately to defend it. A scene unfolds of Sylvanas consorting with the three Dreadlords as she no longer hears the Lich King's voice in her head and is willing to temporarily ally with the Dreadlords in secret to take down Arthas and Ner'zhul. As Arthas prepares at Lord Ron's capital, he finds himself trapped by the Dreadlords who have taken advantage of the Lich King's waning influence and have commandeered some of his undead. Arthas fights his way out of the city and meets up with Sylvanas' banshees in order to lead him to safety. But instead of safety, it's actually another trap, and Sylvanas tries to kill Arthas with a slow poisoning arrow in order to savor her revenge. However, it turns out to be too slow, and Kel'Thuzad arrives to rescue Arthas. Arthas leaves on a boat to Northrend and leaves Lordaeron under the command of Kel'Thuzad. Meanwhile, Sylvanas broods about her newfound undead freedom when one of the dreadlords, Ferimothras, invites her to his cause. She declines and makes a new enemy in him, but after destroying his forces, she's able to spare his life in exchange for assistance in taking down his brethren. Meanwhile, Arthas lands in Northrend to discover that the Blood Elves and Illidan are the ones attacking the continent. At that time, the King of the Nerubians, Anubarak, arrives to join forces with Arthas and tells him of a secret underground path to reach Icecrown faster, which they then battle their way to reach. Back in Lordaeron, Sylvanas locates Deatherox's encampment, which includes a brainwashed human encampment helmed by Garethos along with it. Covertly, she infiltrates over nighttime to weaken their forces before they wake up, and eventually takes both encampments down. Afterwards, she promises Garethos the return of his people's land if he aids her in taking down the final Dreadlord in the capital, to which he reluctantly agrees. So Sylvanas, Verimothris, and Garethos work together to take down Balnazar. Jeez, these names, dude. Uh, anyway, once finished, Sylvanas has Verimothris kill Balnazar himself as a test of loyalty. Then she betrays Garethos and has him killed too. Afterwards, she renames her undead tribe as the Forsaken and decides to settle into the ruined capital, thus ending her story for this game. Chapter 7 is split up into three parts, but really there's not much to say. Arthas and Anubarak just make their way through the caverns, slaughtering dwarves and thonic horrors along their way to the other side. Once at the other side, Illidan, Vaj, and Kale have already set up their bases around the throne chamber's peak. In order to open the chamber, one must activate four obelisks, and so Arthas battles Illidan for control of all four, eventually taking them, followed by one final cutscene battle where Arthas strikes Illidan down, and though, while not explicitly shown, Illidan does survive to see Arthas enter the peak. Arthas climbs the winding staircase, hearing the voices of all those he's betrayed on his journey. Once he reaches the top, he swings his sword and shatters Ner'zhul's prison. Arthas dons the special armor to merge and become one with the Lich King, just before sitting there ominously, thinking about what to do next, or something. And that's the end. Almost. There's still that bonus campaign. Well, more like three extended bonus mega missions, where you mostly just play as a few heroes rather than a whole army. But anyway, it goes like this. The campaign takes place a few months after the Battle of Mount Hyjal and revolves around the half-ogre, half-orc named Rexar who lives in the wilds. He encounters an orc who is slain trying to send a message to Thrall in his new city of Orgrimmar. 
Rexar takes the message to Thrall and decides to do a few odd jobs for him in return for their hospitality. During these jobs, a hostile human presence becomes known to the orcs, and Rexar has to destroy a settlement, go warn and collect some trolls, and eventually takes Thrall's place in a parlay with the humans, which turns out to be a trap, where Rexar defeats the ambush and tells Thrall of the humans' treachery. Thrall doesn't quite believe that these attacks could be at the hands of Jaina, so he sends Rexar to get a response from her himself. They enlist an honorabaru samurai, who has the best voice lines, by the way. Oh, taste my blade! Are you hero and obey? Yes! Yes! And he distracts the human settlement by blowing up their buildings, and Rexar sneaks his way to Theramore to meet Jaina. He takes her back with him to be greeted by some fish people, finds a human survivor that says like three words that Jaina instantly understands, and they return back to Theramore just in time for Jaina's dad to show up because he's actually the one behind all the attacks. I think in Warcraft 2 they say his name was Dalen. Anyway, he didn't get the memo about the Alliance Horde truce thing, and doesn't trust Jaina's womanly imaginings. So Rexar has to escape and tells his troll buddy Vol'jin, who in turn tells him to recruit the Torrens. So Rexar goes to meet Karen, but he's all sad-faced because he thinks his son has been killed. So Rexar goes out to rescue the big guy because they expected one of them in the wreckage, brother, and they initiate their flight plan back to Cairn, which involves crashing this plane and slaughtering all the centaurs along the way with no survivors. Okay, I'll stop now. After they return, Cairn is overjoyed to see his son alive, and he says he'll join. Then Rexar has to go convince the ogres to join the cause against the humans, so he talks to the Stone Maul leader Korgal and asks if he can join their clan. To do so, he goes through the initiation trial of killing lots and lots of things, and then challenges Korgal to a one-on-one -on -one duel and wins it to become their leader, after which he volunteers them to go help Thrall. Then, Thrall gives Rexar a shopping list of items for an enchantment on the Horde's new flag, after which he initiates Rexar into the Horde as a champion, to which he humbly accepts. Then, Rexar and friends storm Admiral Proudmoore's base and destroy it, but the Admiral runs away back to his home base at Theramore. The Horde is about to cross to the Isle of Theramore, but the Admiral set up a blockade of ships. So, Rexar hires some goblin vessels to take them down, and the Horde advances upon the Isle. Jaina says it's okay to kill her father, but to spare some of her men in the process, because she cares more about them, I guess. So, after an assault on the city, Rexar and the gang encounter and ultimately take down the Admiral. At once, the battle is immediately over and everyone goes home. Thrall offers a home at Duratar to Rexar, but he declines, claiming his place as a wanderer is in the wilderness. But he's proud to remain a member of the Horde and that he may be called upon at any time. The end. And not just of that story, but of all of Warcraft 3's narrative entirely. So if you actually made it through all of them, then seriously, congratulations. We did it. Now, the new campaigns and stories don't quite uplive to the base games, in my opinion. A lot of what happened is either reversed or didn't seem to matter much at all in the first place. It still tells a cohesive story, but there's an unshakable sense of pointlessness to a lot of the events that take place. The Night Elves' whole campaign is to capture and execute Illidan, only to let him go free right at the end. Maiev still goes after him, but is promptly and completely forgotten about immediately after Kael'thas is able to free Illidan again. And speaking of those two, their plot is to join together to take over Outland, and once they do, Kil'jaeden instantly shows up to send them right back to Azeroth. Then Sylvanas and Arthas separate and set themselves up with their own newish independent rules, but in the end they don't really seem to be much further along than where they started. It kinda makes you wonder what they were up to between Archimon being summoned and up to his defeat. Arthas popped up in Kalimdor briefly just to tease Illidan for being a dumb stupid elf, but that's about it. It's a story of partnerships forming and ending, and since there's no longer a common threat to unify against, everyone is struggling to fill in holes of power in their own way. And while I enjoy getting to see the after effects of the first game, a lot of what you do tends to feel pretty pointless other than for the purpose of getting a certain character to join or leave others. I guess the overarching narrative of the story is that Illidan wants to destroy the Frozen Throne because he's scared to kill Jaden, and Arthas wants to preserve it for more or less the same reason. And everything else that happens apart from those things just feels somewhat disappointing when they don't really seem to have any sort of payoff. Naturally, not everything is going to work out according to plan every time, and I'd argue the story is more about fleshing out characters and their interactions and or bonds with one another, but from the perspective of someone playing a game, it's tough to shake the feeling of, why did I just do all of that if none of it was going to matter anyway? However, with all that said, it's still an enjoyable experience. There's a great focus on character, and watching all the powers interact in this uncertain period of time is quite entertaining. In that respect, it's a lot like Beyond the Dark Portal, where everyone is scurrying around trying to sort things out and save themselves. Except this time there's a higher degree of presentation involved. It's all just a big excuse to give us a little more Warcraft to play, and, well, that's good enough. Warcraft's story, and I speak for the entire thing here, not just the expansion, was never anything deep or profound or moving or anything like that. It was never meant to be particularly serious or sprawling. You know, why didn't Arthas just fly the Frostworms to Ice Crown? All it wanted was to make a fun fantasy adventure using common reimagined tropes with small twists and simplistic but believable actions and motivations across a host of varied characters and inhabitants. And it did all of that beautifully. It hits just the right balance between cliché and creative to make a world that's familiar, yet new in a way that's just plain fun to take part in. It's that classic, cozy fantasy environment that's simple, but not too simple, where you just snuggle up to it and imagine Christopher Lee dictating the events from a dusty old book as you lose yourself in his exquisite bushy eyebrows. May they and he rest in peace. But, um, clearly I'm running out of things to say, and I think that takes care of it for Frozen Throne, honestly. 
So let's just talk a bit about Reforged, and we'll get to closing statements. Warcraft 3 Reforged is a Warcraft 3 HD simulator with copyright licensing clauses written by Satan, at the time of writing this anyway. It is, in effect, the same game as the original, with a few minor tweaks to certain balancing issues, some visual renovations, and a new graphical presentation. Otherwise, totally identical in every way. Same sounds, voices, story, gameplay, everything. Even going so far as to run on what is very nearly the same engine as the original. Uh, hey, Future Me just chiming in to say that Blizzard actually did in fact add some new bonus missions that were previously cut from the prologue, and they reworked a couple of other missions. There is some new content to Reforged. Not a lot, but it does have some new and slightly altered content from the original game. Alright, that's all I wanted to say, but everything else should be pretty, pretty accurate. Performance and operability has been, to put it lightly, shaky on release, but there's no way of telling how that may improve going forward. If you were brand new to Warcraft 3 and you wanted to experience the original game with more modern graphical representation, then Reforged may be good for that one specific scenario. However, from almost any other perspective, it's been seen as more of an insulting and poorly composed re-release that takes what was previously established in the original and treads all over it, with particular mention to the abysmal multiplayer matchmaking and actively hostile approach against user-generated content. In their defense, I think there was really no way they could have pleased people with this. If they changed too much, people would complain that they should have left it the way that it was, and if they left it the way that it was, then they were lazy and didn't change anything. And I know this to be the case because both complaints were made against it all throughout its development. As it stands, very little is different, and what is different is either barely noticeable as being an improvement or painfully inferior implementation compared to the original, or outright removed entirely. And as added salt to the wound, most of these changes have been retroactively and forcefully applied to the original to create interoperability between it and Reforged for online. So the only way to play the classic game now, without the added improvements, is to own a physical copy, avoid downloading any patches, and use privately run matchmaking services. So overall, it fails to satisfy pretty much anyone other than people who never played the original and don't know any better. Many of the main gripes that have been made against it have been regarding its online features, and I've already stated that I never really cared for those elements in the first place, but that's beside the point that Blizzard's approach to them was decidedly less than satisfactory. I didn't care about the new graphics and I didn't care about the online features, so I never really cared about the remake, and when it turned out poorly, I myself wasn't particularly disappointed. A remake only seems necessary if certain elements of a game could be fixed or improved in some way, and from what I can tell, there really wasn't anything Blizzard could have done to make Warcraft 3 any better than it already was, but I'm by no means an expert. It's almost like making a shot-for-shot -shot remake of a classic film just to make it look slightly more modern. It all too often feels pointless and lacking the heart and spirit of the original. Of all the Warcraft games that could have been remade, I think it's safe to say that Warcraft 3 was the least in need of it. It really had nothing to be gained besides looking a little bit nicer and being a bit more accessible and present to modern audiences. In regards to the graphics of Reforged, there's a concept in design that has to do with how busy something is. Basically, the more intricately detailed and the more stuff something has, means it's more busy. Typically, good design can be attained by making something more simple and easy to recognize. Not always, but it's a good rule of thumb. This is of critical importance for games like this, where there's a whole bunch of elements on screen at once, and you need to be able to distinguish one thing from another really quickly across everything that's on screen. And because the models are more detailed, they're more busy. And because they're more busy, they're slightly more difficult to distinguish from one another at a glance. The overall strength of the initial design still works really really well here, especially combined with some of the new elements, but it does feel noticeably more cluttered, and some things tend to pop out less, which, while not exceptionally unseemly, is still worth mentioning. You can tell they put some thought into updating the graphics to be more in line with the highly detailed quality of today's games while still maintaining that cartoonish quality of the original, but personally, I think they leaned a bit too far into territory that's not necessarily realistic per se, but just has a lot more going on than it probably needs. You know, everything is weathered and worn to such an exaggerated degree. There's nothing that isn't chipped, scuffed, or worn down in some way. But I guess that's just what the Warcraft aesthetic has become over the years. Got a bunch of pointy bits on your spear? Better give them a bunch of dents and chips in places where it's physically impossible for them to have received any. I get the mentality of designing a world that feels lived in, but you gotta admit, some of this is a little excessive. And I know that part of Warcraft's identity is being comically excessive, but I think that's something that's better displayed in the macroscopic realm, rather than the fine details. Take Frostmourne, for example. It's an excessively decorative sword, yes, but it still looks somewhat functional. Now look at this... thing. Some of the models look great. Some of them are clearly unfinished, lacking the well-considered animations present in the originals, and others look downright bad. Graphically, the game is a roller coaster of quality and not a very exciting one at that, with clear evidence of its excessively rushed release. As an aside, if you ever see a game receive a delay that's only like one or two months long, that's usually not a very good sign. And now we get to the matter of user-generated content, which, while I personally haven't had any vested interest in, I can't offer any respect towards Blizzard's approach. 
It's a shame that their interest in revitalizing Warcraft and community creations was focused towards optimizing their own capital gain, rather than a genuine interest in sharing and nourishing the genre, and creativity afforded by people with a genuine interest in creating fun and interesting ways to play with the tools given to them. To use that as a means of shamelessly and forthrightly taking advantage of that generosity and dedication for all their worth is a clear betrayal of any respect to consumers and creators alike. I do want to make it clear that the developers and designers are definitely not the ones to blame for how the game turned out. I'm sure if they had their way, they would have taken their time and found a way to get the game running and playing as best as they could. And if it's at all possible, I'm sure they would like to work on fixing all these issues to make Reforged as good a game as it deserves to be. When it comes to point the blame, the ones responsible for the game releasing in such a state are the corporate and upper managements, of which Blizzard has regrettably fallen into rather greedy hands, and it comes as no surprise to see their seedy practices exercised on yet another beloved property. In the end, Reforged is still playable and is not by any means a bad way of playing the game for just the story, but if the graphical redesigns fail to impress you as they have me, then it has no advantages or redeeming qualities when compared to the original. And when combined with Blizzard's hostile and parasitic approach against its own user base, then it becomes quite undeniable to even consider supporting the product to which these improvements have been attached. It's our duty as consumers to not buy into business practices we deem reprehensible. So I just want to make it clear that I didn't purchase this game, and neither should you, at least until the game is in a state we deem acceptable. Perhaps the issues will be rectified in the future, and perhaps not, but suffice to say, currently, the game at this point is not worth the price of admission. Just find a way to play the original. Warcraft 3 is special. You just don't get many games that are as consistently good from start to finish across its full array of features like this. And I think I've probably harped on about it over and over again as to why that is. I mean, just look how long this video was. About half of it was story stuff, but you get the idea. I made this whole series of videos and put as much time and effort into the other two and this one because I think this game deserves it. And after playing and reviewing the first two games, my appreciation for this one has only grown just by seeing how exceptionally far it came from them, which was very, very far indeed. But well, folks, that's it. That's all the Warcraft there is, for the time being anyway. There is World of Warcraft still, but I've tried it multiple times over the years and frankly, I'm not into it. But if there's any more true Warcraft one day, then rest assured, I'll be there, for better or for worse. Oh yeah, and there's that movie. I've never done a film review before, and I'm not sure how well that could go if I tried, but if there's any interest in me talking even more about Warcraft, then I guess I could consider it. If you've watched all three videos, then I'm very thankful to you. And if you happen to have been following these videos as they've been coming out, then I'm exceptionally thankful to you too. It's taken a really long time, and I'm very sorry to have made you all wait this long. There's been what, a movie, two expansions, and a third on the way? Yeah, I had no idea it would take this long, and a lot has changed since I started this thing almost five years ago. But despite all of that, I'm happy to have done it, and I hope you all enjoyed it nonetheless. And if you've been with me through it all, then well, we're basically married at this point. So stay true, and I'll see you in the next one. Corruption.